want you to use your imagination here for a moment and just imagine the shrill and nearly understandable singing voice of Bob Dylan. As he's singing the song, The Times, They Are A-Changing. I won't try to imitate it for you. Now, most who first heard Dylan's prophetic song, which was in 1964, hardly needed to be told. The times, they were changing. And we, I think, feel very like that today, that the world is a-changing. How many feel that already? It's changing. And in many ways, it's already changed, and it's continuing to change, and that change is only accelerating. Now, I'm almost never an alarmist. I'm rarely a pessimist. And uh, I'm for sure not a conspiracy theorist. But I'm just going to say, friends, though I trust Jesus implicitly, I worry about a world that right now I think is slouching toward tyranny. And there seem to be a great many forces at work in the world that have little or no room for authentic Christian faith. And I have been laboring about whether to even speak of it, and I think the time is now. There's something, there's something going on in the culture that neither loves God nor tolerates him. I vividly remember, many of you do, watching the Berlin Wall coming down in 1989 on television. It might be the most significant moment of the late 20th century, though when I talked about it with my students at Uni College, not one student in my class even knew what the Berlin Wall was. Why it had been raised in the first place and why it had come down. Not one. Now, as the wall came down, I remember believing that we were actually entering a new world in which freedom would reign. Before its fall, at that moment, two-thirds of the world's population lived under totalitarian regimes. Most of us alive believed that that would probably change now. And for a while, everything seemed to validate, validate our utopian hopes. But silly us. That's not how the world works. That's not human nature, I fear. And that's not the nature of the world. Totalitarianism is a strong word. And I use it with some pause here. To speak of it is to sound conspiratorial. Oppression may be the one common denominator of history, but so is the belief in America that it can't happen here. Totalitarianism is, after all, the stuff of Hitler's Germany or Mussolini's Italy, Mao's China or Lenin and Stalin's Soviet Union, Castro's Cuba, perhaps, or Pol Pot's Cambo Cambodia but not America. But I am one who agrees with one of my great heroes, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who said totalitarianism can happen anywhere. And the Bible makes it even clear that it really can happen anywhere. But that's not the kind of hard, unwelcome totalitarianism that I'm talking about today. I'm not suggesting in any way that we are moving toward gulags and re-education camps. Well, I mean, not gulags. No, I'm, I'm talking about a soft totalitarianism that is not essentially political, that's cordially embraced, and very often applauded as it creeps into our own lives. Now think for a moment. We live in a world that runs almost exclusively on the Internet. Everything from hospital records to buying patterns to created documents that we might make to interpersonal communication 
It's all placed into the trusting hands of five companies. Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, and Google, among others. Now, did you know that each one of those companies has more economic power than more than two-thirds of the countries in the world? Each one of those companies. Even our mechanism for communicating and distributing news lies almost exclusively in their hands now. Yet none of these companies, I would say none, have proved themselves trustworthy with that information. Their agendas forcibly end up being our agendas. People have often begun to speak in hushed tones at work, at the water coolers, in their own homes when discussing controversial topics like politics, race, sexual orientation, and of course, religion. And why wouldn't they actually when we live in a world where one offhand politically incorrect statement can actually destroy a reputation, a business, a livelihood, and even a family in a moment. Worse than that, one politically incorrect statement made decades ago can destroy an individual today. Now, as a devout follower of the increasingly despised sect known as Christianity, one doesn't have to think hard about the ramifications when those companies are anything but friendly toward Jewish or Christian values. And it becomes increasingly hard to guess what tomorrow's big taboo statement will be. I mean, yesterday, J.K. Rowling was the toast of the world for writing the Harry Potter series. Today, she's a pariah among some because she dared to suggest that men don't menstruate. A statement deemed to be anti-trans. And don't worry, she's rich enough, she'll be just fine. Now, back when Germany was divided east and west, East Germany had the most sophisticated of all secret police forces, the Stasi. Homes and phones were routinely tapped. In our world, though, 70 million, million of us, including me, have already brought Alexa and Siri into our homes. And the Stasi would be floored at how easy that was. And how naive we as Adventists have been imagining that we could somehow run to the hills to get away from the world when we carry the world in our pockets. Everywhere we go, along with the location and our identity and our ability to buy and sell. How silly of us that we never considered the possibility that the world with all its pleasures and conveniences and fun would actually seem more appealing in the end than the tedium of prayer and Bible study, evangelism, and obedience. My point here is, is not to describe the terrifying prospect of a surveillance economy in which our actions are repackaged and sold to our to other outlets in order to sell us stuff, which is a little unnerving, but it's happening all the time. And sometimes that's convenient. But my point here is to demonstrate how thin the line has become between the private and the public world. The world we are marching toward is what intellectuals and cultural critics are calling the post-Christian and by that, they, uh, they don't mean that Christianity has ceased to be, hardly. We still have a population in which 70% claim to believe in God. Though that number is collapsing rapidly. Christianity is still the largest religion in the world and in America. And yet, despite the large numbers, people of faith, have no place at the table of popular culture. Some of that by choice, a very poor choice in my estimation, and some of it not. Christianity has little to 
no influence over popular music, film, stage, book and magazine publishing, television, and sports, which, by the way, is where the mass of people live. Very few news outlets consider religion to be even relevant enough anymore to merit having a religion editor like they used to have. And those that still actually have a religion editor rarely have Christians in that position. As a result, most truly devout lovers of Jesus often feel alone and self-conscious and insecure in this new world. And many have simply gone silent, blended into the woodwork at work and even among friends. Are you with me so far? And the silence, I believe, is because of fear. It's a very real fear. A fear of being shoved to the margins of society, of being singled out, of losing our monetized platforms online, of damaging our job or promotion prospects, and worst of all, of just being shamed. Church attendance, especially among the mainline Protestant churches and Catholic churches as well, are in an absolute free fall, though evangelical numbers are remaining steady we're still falling. And many critics believe this is less from a decline in authentic faith and more from the increasing comfort of nominal Christians, that is, Christians in name only, to simply drop away. Many no longer see church as necessary with uh, community available elsewhere. The growing and vocally militant atheists are, of course, exultant. You don't have to read very far to see this. The secular utopia of John Lennon's Imagine is at last coming to fruition, they say. The situation I'm describing, I believe, will only grow worse as we Christians continue to lose our ability to speak up and to speak out. So what is a devout disciple and lover of Christ to do in a post-Christian world? What are we to do? What is new creation to do? I have been thinking about this, praying about this, agonizing over this question. How are we to live in such a world, exiles in what used to be home? Now, first, overreaction is a mistake. And absolute pessimism is downright unbiblical. And yet, as I believe these changes to be somewhat inevitable, it's time for the devout, the devout, to discuss our resistance. How do we weather the storm of soft totalitarianism? Resistance is not futile, and it is necessary. How do we preserve our own sanity, our happiness, and yes, our faith? How do we negotiate our employment our, and our, our commerce and leisure without diluting faith? How do we live in the world without our faith dissolving into the boiling cynicism of our day? Fortunately, we don't have to search far because we have advice in Scripture. We're not entering into a unique world. Rather, the world we have been living in is what has been unique one that is not merely friendly to faith, but informed by it. That is the exception. But what we are headed to is what most of the faithful have most often lived through, the norm rather than the exception. And we can learn from the great cloud of witnesses who've gone before us. And I've tried to assemble the beginnings of a survival manual, and I'm calling it Rules for Rebels in a Post-Christian World. I actually even made a printout, and if you would like to have a copy of this, this is, this is a rough draft that I'm hoping to work on with you and your help over the next period of time. But these, are rule, these rules aren't new, and nothing I say here is new, and they're still fluid, as you'll see. And as I 
put together a roadmap for Christians entering the post-Christian world, I, I would welcome feedback as I think this is a joint process that may just be our mission as a church, helping believers maintain real faith in a world hostile to real faith. So here we go. I'm just going to show you my seven rules and see what you think. Rule number one, rejoice in the Lord always. The Apostle Paul's happiest book is Philippians, written while in prison, no less. For a man who was repeatedly beaten, imprisoned, mocked, shipwrecked, and even challenged by other believers, Paul seems to find space to write these words. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I love that. I love that a lot. Think about this, though. Paul's writing in Rome, in a Roman prison, as Nero has begun to really ramp up his persecution of the Christians. Now, according to this letter, Paul hopes to visit the Christians in Philippi and elsewhere, but we know he never will. He'll visit no one, actually. He'll remain in a damp Roman prison for four years at least and finally be martyred, most likely beheaded. And yet, he writes, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. You see, gratitude and joy are central to our resistance. The world can take our freedom away. And you are blind if you think it already has not begun. But it can't take away our gratitude in Christ. Like the old spiritual says, ain't nothing going to steal my joy. Gratitude is the antidote of bitterness, of hate, of rage, and of riots. The world would have us weaponize our resentments, but gratitude, on the other hand, teaches us to make sense of our past, no matter how terrible. It gives us purpose for our present, and it gives us hope for the future. So rejoice in the Lord always. Rule number two is this. Be as cunning as snakes and as harmless as doves. Now, I have to say, Jesus said many things that still surprise me, and probably none more than his instruction to his disciples as he sent them out into a hostile world. He said this, Look, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves, so be as shrewd or as cunning as snakes and harmless as doves. Now, in that same chapter, Jesus warns his disciples how they will be handed over to courts. They may be whipped. They may to stand trial. But these are actually opportunities, he tells them, to tell unbelievers and rulers about him. So he goes on and says, don't worry about how you will respond. God will give you the right words at the right time. For it is the spirit of your father speaking through you. I love that. Like a dove, we are not to be hurtful or harmful. But we are, he says, to be astute. Dare I use the word calculated and shrewd. Our purpose is to glorify Christ, not to bully people or assert our own rightness onto others. I like this rule that Jesus gives us. Rule number three says this. Know the truth. It will set you free. You see, it's easy even now, even now, to feel trapped, confined, imprisoned by a crass world closing in on us, by a culture that presses hard against our values. We can't sit down and watch television for five minutes without realizing we are not at home in this world anymore. But Jesus tells us that it is by knowing the truth that we can be free. So how does this work? 
It's not by learning all the falsehoods out there, as so many Christians have attempted to do. This only actually causes us to be judgmental and, frankly, irritating to others. It's better to be like the expert at identifying counterfeit money. The best way to spot a counterfeit bill is not to learn the millions of ways one can fake a bill, but to know the one true bill truly well. By closely examining the truth, we'll know a fake when we see it. That's why it's essential that we as believers, now more than ever, assertively and tenaciously explore the Word of God. Psalm 119, the largest chapter in the Bible, is a beautiful call and celebration of Scripture study. And I love verse 9 where it says, How can a young person stay on the path of purity? By studying the Word of God. You will know the truth truth will set you free rule number four now up here it says remember who you are and are not but on your sheet i i changed it and i wrote remember whom you serve it's crucial that we remember the opening words of the ten commandments and actually the opening of most pronouncements that god makes He almost always opens with the words, I am the Lord your God. Whatever the situation is, we must pause and remember who we are and who he is. So right here, just take a moment. If anyone's feeling like, man, this is making me a little anxious. Remember whom you serve. And just that thought for me feels better. You're going to be all right. Rule number five. This is an important one. Resist loneliness. In my opinion, hands down, the greatest scholar and critic of totalitarianism of any sort is the great Hannah Arendt, whose book, The Origins of Totalitarianism, which came out in the middle of the century, is a must-read for all truly concerned about it. And in that book, Hannah Arendt writes this. Terror can rule absolutely only over men who are isolated against each other. Therefore, one of the primary concerns of all tyrannical government is to bring this isolation about. Isolation may be the beginning of terror. It certainly is its most fertile ground. It always is its result. This isolation is, as it were, pre-totalitarianism. Its hallmark is impotence insofar as power always comes from men acting together. Isolated men are powerless by definition. I think this is of value because when we're alone and lonely, we lose more than just companionship. We lose a sense of team, and we lose a sense of perspective. This, I believe, is why the New Testament urges us to meet together, not every once in a while, but often, building each other up. Strange, isn't it, that in the age that promised more social contact than any other age, thanks to so-called social media, People, especially young people, are experiencing loneliness in record numbers. Thus, depression and an incredible loss of perspective. Arendt argued that such loneliness and the sense of isolation is fertile ground for totalitarianism, even soft totalitarianism. Why? She wrote, because we lose the distinction between fact and fiction. That is, the reality of experience. And we lose the distinction between the true and the false, the standards of thought. Does this not sound like prophecy almost? It is why it's vital that we find a devout church family, a body of believers. We need each other, and we are needed. 
But it's also, by the way, why it's vital that we join smaller circles of believers to associate with, to study with, to eat with, to pray with. We should seek those people out. Seek them out and, in, and, and invite them. Without friends in Christ, we will not withstand the, uh, the attack on right and wrong and true and false that culture will heave on us. We cannot withstand without the body of Christ. Rule 6 says this, in all your ways, acknowledge him. One of my favorite memory verses, if not my favorite memory verse as a child, is Proverbs 3, 5 to 6. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lead not into your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. I love that. In short, I think what that text is saying is that I will give authority in everything to God. That word acknowledge, actually the word in, uh, in the Hebrew is yada. And yes, it's the same word as yada, yada, yada. It's like saying, I got it, I got it, I got it. So it's, a, it's an acknowledgement. Yes, okay, I've already got it, I've got it, I've got it. It literally means to give the tip of the hat or the bow the, to give the recognition and the authority. Now think about this for a minute. When you let a friend drive your car, I mean, if you actually do that, <laughs> you are acknowledging that person, granting her the authority to drive your car and trusting her to know that she knows what she's doing, even if nervously. <laughs> let me put it another way. If we think we're smart enough, clever enough to know what to do next, when to do it, for how long, we're wrong. But God knows all that. In all your ways, acknowledge him. That is, give him the keys. And he'll not only direct your paths to the destination, he'll drive you there. And then the last rule is do not conform to the world. Coming back to Alexander Solzhenitsyn and his final essay before he died in 1976, he titled it Live Not By Lies. Now, I can't stress enough how much I love and enjoy Solzhenitsyn. He is one of my favorite authors. He lived through 10 years in a Soviet gulag. He survived communist oppression. He suffered intellectual criticism. He suffered exile. And in the middle of that, by the way, he won a Nobel Prize for Literature. So that's a pretty good life, don't you think? And his last essay, addressing how best to survive totalitarianism of any kind, he offered up this final essay, Live Not By Lies. In short, don't conform. He argued that the most powerful resistance to a world that would control you he, is not to fight. It's not to actively revolt, but to live in authentic honesty. It means never do what your values will not permit, even if it costs you. Even if it costs you. Now, there's a story that Rod Dreher tells in his book of the same title, Live Not By Lies. And it's a story of a grocer in Czechoslovakia. And he is very aware of the grotesque lies that the communist dictatorship of Czechoslovakia is asking him to live by. But he generally wants people to leave him alone. So he puts a sign, as he's told to do, in the front of his store that just says in, in the Czech language there, workers of the world unite. He just wants to get along. But one day he realizes, you know, I'm, I feel that this is, against, this is against who I am to, to show myself to be in support of what the government is doing. So he just very quietly puts the sign down. Now, he, he takes the sign down and... He, he's polite all the time, but anytime I ask him why he took it down, he'll tell them exactly why he took it down. 
As a result, he lost his shop. Not only did he lose his shop, he lost his, his friends, his kids, lost their ability to enter college. He was stripped of his rights to travel, both within the country and without the country. And he scarcely was able to feed his own family as a result. And it seems when you look at it that, it, that nothing good came from this simple act of truthfulness. But Solzhenitsyn argues not so. Dozens of inter individuals could see what he did. And they began to act, not, not all at once, but they began to also do things living truthfully. Some of those ones lost their rights too, but some didn't. It's difficult to punish everybody. And some of the leaders actually admired the honesty. Now the grocer may or may not ever gotten a chance to see the truthfulness uh, as being worth it, but within a very short time, Czechoslovakia became a free country. It eventually split. Scripture has names for people like that. People who live not by lies. People who are truthful even if it costs them. People like Abraham and Rahab, Nehemiah, Ruth. And some of them live happily ever after, like, say, Joseph or David, and some don't, like Jonathan. Some are brutally killed for their honesty, like Stephen and Jesus. All, and all served as powerful torpedoes against a mighty ship of soft totalitarianism. Solzhenitsyn essentially is saying, do not conform to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? The role of the church is changing, friends. It's not a club. It's never been a club, even though we tried to make it a club. And it's not a community center. It is a bastion of resistance in a dark world. And I just want to say right now, I want to pledge myself as a member of this congregation, as a member of, of a world of devout disciples of Christ. I want to pledge my role to encourage that resistance as a biblical act to train people and to teach other people and to encourage other people to resist a world that hates Christ and with the grace of God and the work of the Holy Spirit and the encouragement of this beautiful bastion of rebellion right here on the front lines of a hostile world we can push back the very gates of hell. Pray with me. Father God, the world has been changing for a long time, and we have tried so hard not to notice. We've tried so hard to be oblivious to it. But rapidly, we're being asked to, to choose which side we are on, and I pray that as for us, and our families, that we will choose the Lord. Teach us how to be a fortress, a bastion of resistance against a culture that hates you, against wickedness that would dilute faith. Help us to be able to reach out and bring people in so they can see where the joy is, because that joy is solely in Christ where they can see where a body of believers is here to build each other up, where we can introduce them to the God who says that if we acknowledge him, that you will direct our ways. And Lord, where they could come and interact with you, our God whom we serve. May we be that. Give us the courage. Give us the bravery to be real disciples in a post-Christian world. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.